Good afternoon, Liberia. I welcome you in the name of Jesus, and we greet you in the name of Jesus from the United States of America here in Florida. I hope that your day is well and things are going well. I'm just uh, privileged to be able to again be with you by radio. We are uh, calling uh, this particular lesson Message 2 of the Prayer Altars. We are certainly excited about bringing messages into Liberia, so we consider this a great privilege. Uh, my name is Clifford Lara. I'm with City Plan, which is uh, based here in uh, Tampa, Florida, and I hope that uh, as we go on through these messages that you will find something that you can take with you, something that can build within your life, and something that uh, will honor God also. So bless you, and uh, let's just pray this in. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are new every day. It doesn't matter where we fall upon the earth, what continent we fall upon the earth, your sun rises in the east and sets in the west. You show yourself faithful even through creation. So even as the sun rose today, I just ask that you would allow the word of God to rise, that you would allow those things which you've designed to show yourself be prevalent in our lives. So thank you for speaking to us, even through creation, my King. And I bless you, my God. I say, let the Lord of heaven and earth be glorified today. Let it be glorified as we share in the messages of your word. Now, God, you who knows how to bring about your word, speak. Speak through the vessel. Allow me to speak through Christ, the one who is uh, greater than all things. Father, I desire to glorify your Son uh, as you have glorified him. And Lord, may I be like John the Baptist, that I may decrease, that your word, Christ, may increase. So Lord, have your way. Be of good cheer, my God that we may be a people who honor you and bless you. So, Lord, I say blessings unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. This afternoon, I want to be able to uh, relate to you out of the life of Abraham. I want to be able to bring to you a picture. But inside of that picture, I want to be able to show you how God changed how we would relate to him even through the life of Abraham. I'm going to do that through painting a picture as to what was God calling Abraham into and how was he utilizing the life of Abram. At that time, he was called Abram in this. Now, if you hear some, uh, some rumbling in the background, we are having a storm today, and uh, that is uh, some lightning and thunder that's going on. So, uh, the Lord loves to speak, even through the lightning. I remember reading in the Bible that uh, when David was struggling and his enemies were around him, he called upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord chose the darkness, the canopy of darkness, to ride upon his cherubim, and he sent forth lightning, and that lightning scattered the enemies in seven directions. Praise the living God. And uh, helped David. So we just believe that even as these things happen, in the natural realm that God is moving in behalf of us. So if you hear that thunder, let us let us just thank the Lord that his voice is in the thunder, that he causes the earth to shake and men to tremble, that we may honor him and fear the Lord. God, thank you even for those signs that you give us, that we would know that you are defending us. You go before us and you scatter our enemies. Well, praise the Lord. I, I just uh, am grateful again to be here with you. As we uh, begin to go into the story of Abram, I want to just lay out some groundwork, just some thought uh, before we walk into the actual scriptures. And that is, uh, if you've ever been in a conflict or a fight of any size, you may realize that uh, it's best to be on the winning side. No one wants to be on the losing side of a conflict. And there are certain requirements that conflict will require. Conflict will require strategy and weapons, and a purpose that wills the heart to win. Without that, conflict can be easily uh, put in a place where you are not on the winning side. And certainly this is not a complete list that is needed in conflict, nor do I intend for that to be. Really what I'm trying to do is I'm desiring to bring your thoughts into a mindset of battle. And carefully consider the source of your weaponry to overcome or to win. 
Remember that you're no greater than the source by which you are able to come into conflict with. So your armory or your supply of weapons will be challenged, and they will be challenged by the enemy. More importantly, though, is the source of your supply. Is your source coming from uh, the one who doesn't uh, run out? Is it coming from one who is knowing all things? Now, those are critical things before we walk into conflict. So these raises a, a few questions that, that pose, can we actually overcome the battles that we enter into? So weighing the cost prior to engaging in the battle is always critical. When we hear the life of Abraham, God was certainly bringing him into a conflict. And uh, conflict should not be entered into without an end result in mind. God had an end result in mind prior to him engaging Abram. And fighting without a cause is not only fruitless, it will waste time as well as the resources of the kingdom. So God had all of these things in mind as he was calling Abram into the land of Canaan. One of the critical components in entering a battle is to consider a peace plan that will minimize destruction. If we don't consider the peace plan before we enter into the battle, or we don't consider an end, then we will merely be fighting into destruction. And usually that will be fighting in the place of self-gratification. So what are you fighting for would be a question. And to whom are you fighting with? Are they reliable? Are they seasoned in battle? And will they strengthen you when the battle rages? Or will they cause you to shrink back? These are good questions, and I believe that these were actually in the heart of Abram. He knew who he was fighting with. He knew who was calling him. And he knew that the battle was not merely his. And the one whom he fought with inside of recovering the land of Canaan was one who would not cause him to shrink back. It was someone that he could literally lean into. It was someone that he had hope in, and it was someone that accredited him righteousness. So these are all very powerful things that should lend our hearts into the realization that if we're going to walk into conflict, that we ought to do it with one who is worthy of the conflict, one who's worthy to be uh, in the battlefield with. So it is best to enter the battle with the counsel of the one who knows the beginning from the end. You remember the word uh, inside of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah literally is told to rely upon God. And God does it by just speaking a few words in the, in the passages of Jeremiah 12.5. He says, if you have run with footmen and they have wearied you, then how will you contend with the horses? My friends, I want to say this to you, beloved. If you intend to run with the horses, you cannot do this through man's ways. There is a call that is much deeper than the way men do things, and that call comes from God himself. So the call of Abram was bound in great conflict, and that is really in many levels, with the enemy well entrenched in the battlefield of Canaan. Now some people may not look at this life of Abram as walking into conflict or walking into a battle, but uh, those of you who have live the life where you've seen war, where you've seen conflict, you know that these battles are entrenching and they will take time and there is always death and life inside of them. And there is always a battle for either a region or a people or a particular source that people may want. And God is establishing a desire to have Canaan given unto the nations. Canaan is really a place whereby God will use to speak to the nations. So God designs a strategy that had never been done in the past. And God was now engaging man in cleansing a land while giving dominion over a region for a godly purpose. Now this strategy... And the purpose was to provoke his presence and reveal the fear of the Lord to the nations. The whole uh, precipice of this is that God is desiring that Abram would follow the ways of God and in so doing create a nation 
that would be an example to the nations. In fact, they would be a people who would, in fact, be the threshold of salvation even unto the Gentile. So it's an important thing that God is revealing here. This new warfare, this is a warfare that had never been done before, that combats not only on the earth, but also in the heavenly places. Up to this point, what we see as far as combat upon the earth, as well as in the heavenly places, would be covenants, which Adam made, there's an Adamic covenant, as well as the uh, covenant which Noah did after the flood. But here we're seeing a different type of conflict, a different type of battle. This particular battle is now engaging man into recovering a territory for a people and for God. Now, he's not recovering the land for God. He's cleansing the land for God. Even in the time of Adam and Eve, God never lost a thing. Men lost their position, but God has never lost his. And so God has now the inherent ability to give to Abram the land of Canaan. It is his. All creation is the Lord's. He has never lost that, nor has he ever given that away. This is the first time. Even when he spoke to Adam, he did not give Adam creation. He told him he was going to allow him to rule over it. He was going to allow him to steward it. But it had not been given him. Now we're hearing words that are being spoken to a man that seemingly have never been. And he's saying, I'm going to give you Canaan. And this is an interesting thing, and certainly we couldn't give something away that we didn't own. But for God, it is outright war against the adversary as he gives him this. It's an outright war against the one who fights against our very souls. It's an outright war against Satan in the heavenly realms. On earth, it is a war against the ites to cleanse the land. Now, these are a people who are walking by different mindsets than God desires for a nation to be in. It is a battle for the territory and for creation. In the heavenly realm, this battle would be considered a battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Now, I won't get into the great details as to what those two kingdoms are, but you can, you can certainly relate that we are, we are seeing a battle of good and evil. And certainly God will prevail. We know that he will prevail not only in this day, but he will prevail in the day we live in, and he will continue to prevail even unto the end of the age. Both kingdoms do manifest upon the earth for good or for destruction. And Abraham is engaging in both realms, the physical as well as the spiritual, as he contends for the land of Canaan. So God is not just calling this man to do something. He is calling this man to a place of warfare. He's not just allowing him to inherit a land. He's literally calling him into warfare. Now, we may not realize that in the sense that uh, the story doesn't say, Abram, I'm calling you into warfare. But we will see as we walk through the scripture that this warfare that Abram is walking into is really bound inside of a covenant with God. So God creates a covenant with Abram, and that covenant will require obedience, it will require surrender, and an act of worship that reveals God's position in Abram's heart. And that is where Abram is at this point. Now, what's interesting is the covenant. The covenant that God establishes with Abram is not simply a covenant of that time, but in the covenant itself, he is revealing that this covenant shall be established, but it shall also move from generation to generation, revealing the goodness of God. So we'll look at some of that, and that will be a little bit of a recap of the last time we spoke, but I think that it is worthy to, to read and worthy to uh, recap just a little bit. So let's go to the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, I'll be going to Genesis chapter 15, starting with verse 1, and I will move on to verse 21. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and read that for you. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid. 
Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. The fact that God says, do not be afraid, means that there will be times when the heart may want to shrink back. There will be times that Abraham is going to experience things that may cause him to tremble. But he assures Abraham inside of this in saying that I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now we know what a reward is. A reward is something uh, that is given to someone who has accomplished something. But he's saying it is because of my shield, it is because of my covering, it is because of my protection that you will know the exceedingly great reward. So it's not dependent upon Abram. Immediately the language of chapter 15 begins to reveal that this is a God thing which God is allowing Abram to come into or to be able to serve in the capacity which God desires. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So the heir of Abraham was of concern within his heart to say, even if he was to do all these things which God desired, who would inherit this? Where would it fall to? For Abram did not have a child. So God knows the desire of his heart. It's interesting how God deals with this. And he says, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven. And here we begin to see the declaration of God revealing not only those things which are on the earth, but those things which are in the heavens. There is, He says, and count the stars if you are able to number them. What is going on here? And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. What is literally happening here is God is now focusing him on the things of the heavens. He's saying, your promises are not merely upon the earth, but they are coming even through the heavens. So if you can look to the heavens, you'll begin to see where my promise is revealed. Isn't that interesting that when we seek the kingdom of God first, all these things shall be added unto us. And he believed in the Lord, according to verse 6, and he accounted to him for righteousness. Now that's a wonderful thing. Uh, oftentimes we speak of the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, and that is well in the New Testament. But here, my God is accrediting a man righteousness. In other words, he is looking at him in a different state. He's not looking at him in a sinful state, but he is looking at him in a state which bears righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land. There it is. He is giving him the land to inherit it. In other words, it will be yours. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? In other words, what he is asking here is, what is going to anchor my faith? What is going to anchor the truth of your word, God? How will I know? Now, Abraham is not one who is uh, not understanding of covenant. Covenants were made between men even in that day. Uh, and he's not absent from understanding sacrifice. For even in the people that he came out of, they in fact did sacrifice, although they also sacrificed things they were not supposed to sacrifice. So he realizes that there are promises that are committed by the spilling of blood. And so he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram. Now these are significant in that they are showing, the, the animals themselves are showing transformation that is going on within themselves. In other words, through each one of these animals there is a representation of a covenant which is going to increase throughout the time. Let's take a look at this. So what do these animals represent? It goes on to say, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. The heifer, 
The heifer is of the time, or literally of the covenant, by which Abraham is in. This is the time of obedience. He is calling Abram to a time of obedience. When we look at the three-year-old female goat, this is representative of a covenant that is yet to come. It is representative of the covenant of the law. And so by which, uh, in the time of Moses that is yet to come, we will lay our hands upon the head of the goat, and he will be the scapegoat. Then you get to the third uh, animal that is three years old, and that is the ram. And the ram is representative of a covenant that is yet to come, and that is the Lamb of God. And then it says here, a turtle dove and a pigeon. Now we need to understand the symbolicness of these two creatures, or these two birds. At that time and in that era, the pigeon was used to really take a message. You would tie a message on the leg of the pigeon and it would go forth. And it would fly to the destination by which you desire that message to go. And the turtle dove was a gentle bird, easily started, startled, excuse me, and that turtle dove, we know, represents the Holy Spirit. So these two birds were never cut in half. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 10, it says, Then he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two down the middle, and placed them each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. So if we understand this properly, we know that eventually the pigeon which represents the message, and the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit, inside of the imagery of these animals, we know that there is a covenant that is going to come, and it is going to uh, begin to unfold from one generation to the next generation, thus giving more realization to the very thought that the heir of Abram is not one that he is going to see fulfilled in his time he would not be able to produce all of the children that would multiply as many as the stars are in the sky. But God is certainly revealing to Abram that this is something that is going to happen through generations. And we will see that happen. It says, it goes on to say, And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. There will be times when God is making a promise to us, and the enemy will want to come and steal that promise away. But we must fight and battle for those things which God desires to covenant with us. It says now in verse 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Now this is an, an interesting piece of Scripture. Remember that, that Scripture has symbolism, it has, uh, uh, it has knowledge, and it has understanding, it has wisdom inside of it. He says it as it really is, and he also uses symbolic language inside of Scripture. These are the different things of Scripture. And when he begins to speak about this, he's giving him a fact. And the fact is, is that there is going to be a people who will be afflicted for 400 years. But the question is, why 400 years? No man from the time of Noah seemingly comes into righteousness. The first time we hear that righteousness is a credit to someone, it is Abram. And so inside of this, though, he says there is going to be this people that are afflicted. God is creating sons for himself. So when you are born again, you are born in Christ. Thus you have an inheritance of Christ. Now if you are not born of Christ, but you are born outside of that, you are born in sin, it is like one who is no longer born, it is like one who is born outside of the marriage, outside of the marriage covenant. We are in a marriage covenant, we are the bride of Christ, and we are to be within Christ. So when God creates literally out of those who are not of him, they are considered like a bastard child. Now in the Bible it says that if one had a child that was a bastard child, that they would have to literally be apart from him and could not enter the temple for ten generations. 
Now that's interesting because 10 generations would be considered 40 years for that particular purpose. And by this, God says, I will redeem you, even as a bastard child, one who is not of me, one who is not born of me, I will redeem you, and I will hold you in this state for 400 years, 10 generations. And at the end of that, he then calls them to Mount Sinai, that he may bring them into the temple, which is his presence, at a place called Mount Sinai, where they will now worship the Lord God Almighty. He goes on to say in verse 14, And also the nations whom they serve I will judge. Afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Here it is again. Abram, this is not something that is going to be fulfilled in you. There is going to be all of these things that are going to happen. But as for you, you're going to die a good old man. And inside of that, you can know that the promises that I have given you will go on even past the 400 years. This is going to take several generations to fulfill. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquities of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Those pieces being the pieces that Abraham had laid out. He had laid these animals out, and now the blood of those animals was spilt into the ground. We know that blood, particularly from the story beginning with Cain and Abel, that blood speaks to God, that blood cries out. And so in the story of Cain and Abel, he says that uh, your brother's blood is crying out to me, Cain. And so we know that. Even the blood of animals cries out to the Lord, particularly when they are made with a covenant. And God has had Abram prepare this, this, this covenant or the pieces of this covenant. He has established these animals. And now we're hearing the words of how God spoke within the darkness of his sleep. And then he says... And it came to pass, in verse 17, And it came to pass, when the sun went down, and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven, and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the river, the river Euphrates. The, Ken the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Parasites, the Rephium, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. These are all different people who are within the land that he is going to begin to uh, send forth out of the land through what Abram is doing. We see these things happening uh, relevantly quickly, at least is what it looks like within Scripture. But the reality of it is that there is much to be done before these things can happen. And uh, as we go on to read, we see that this will be done, and it will be done through the seed of Abram. Now, Abram has a conflict before him. He has a task before him, which is to come into this land that literally has all of these different tribes, if you want to say, or people groups within this land. And we want to see those things to, uh, to come away. It's interesting that the altar of the Lord, or the altar by which God has established his covenant, is that he walks through this covenant. Praise the Lord. There's the voice of the Lord. And what happens is this, Abram is asleep, understanding that he is in a position of rest, and inside of the position of rest, God determines to allow Abram to rest this way. And as he rests this way, you then see this whole position of a dream. And when you see that, you realize that 
It is only God who is walking through the covenant. And what is the blood speaking inside of this covenant? It is only speaking that which God has committed. It is not like a normal covenant where you would have two men walk through the blood of an animal and they would then make agreement with one another. And so inside of that agreement that is blood covered, they would then be bound to one another to perform a particular act. And so you would hear the men of those days when they would make covenant this way, making statements such as, if I go to war, then you will go to war with me, or my possessions are now your possessions, uh, my battles are now your battles. And if you do not rise when I am at war or when the enemy comes, then cursed is this about you. And they would do these types of claims through a covenant. Here God literally walks through by the torch of fire, through this sacrifice, through the heifer, you know, through the female goat, through the ram, through the turtle dove, through the pigeon. What is he doing? He's saying, I am walking through the covenants of time. I am walking through the covenants of generations, and I will fulfill this. It is not God committing Abram to walk through the generations. It is God himself that is fulfilling this purpose. It is God himself who has determined to perform his good measure and his good pleasure. Amen. I hope that you see that inside of the life of this covenant. It is always well that you would establish who you will go through conflict with. It is best to establish where you will fight and how you will fight with the one whom can have victory. No one wants to be on the losing side. So this strategy that is going to be used to take the land of Canaan, a land that is promised to Abram by God himself, the promise that came through the altar is about to be established. So we see how God literally brings Abram through the land. For the sake of time, I will, uh, I will walk through some of these things and let you hear some of these scriptures. I may not read every single one uh, so that we may be able to get a little farther than, uh, than our time may allow. Inside of, uh, inside of this strategy, God is revealing a new way that we can now gain back the land as well as the people. And so now we see this new tact of warfare that is coming through the altar, this new warfare that is allowing us to battle not only for a region, but even for a people. Let's not forget that God has a heart for every one of the ites as well. God has a heart for every man. It is the desire of the heart of God that all would come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is not that he looks at one particular man one way. In fact, even as he produces a nation for himself, he, he relates that to the Hebrews. That he didn't choose them because they were righteous. He chose them because that was what was within his heart. So in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, it says this, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. So here we see that God is desiring to make a nation for himself. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. These are words of covenant. In other words, if one curses you, I will come against them. If one blesses you, I will let them know who you are by blessing them. This is God going before Abram. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Thus we are of the seed of Abram, or Abraham, as his name will change when that happens. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions, and they had gathered, and the people whom they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land in the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebinth tree to Morad. 
and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. Think about this now. So the battle plan has been drawn. I'm going to give this land to you. But immediately it says in verse 6 that the Canaanites were in the land. But yet God says, I'm going to give this to you. And God appears to him, it seems to be at the right moments, whereby he is literally seeing the enemy. He knows that the Canaanites are here. And so he says, hey, that is not your worry. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. In other words, this is my battle. This is my portion. This is my work, and this is my desire that I will give this to you. Now, here is the portion. Here is the new warfare. Here is the new battle by which God is allow, allowing man or calling Abraham to fight by. He says, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Here, Abram worships the living God. He worships him. He stands in a position of worship. And it is in that worship that God instructed Abram. He also assured him in such a way as to provoke him to go. But Abram, a man who understood the sacrificial system, knew how to bind himself to the instructions of God. He knew that he must be obedient. He knew that he must give his heart to God. Right? So here in the seventh verse, Abram does not just presume he will be one to accomplish that which God committed to him. No. On the contrary, Abram creates an altar to honor and worship the true source of this battle, binding himself to God, remembering that it is God who has called these things. The position that Abraham has taken here is not only a position of worship, but it is a position that is humble and obedient in heart. He knows that he is the weaker. He knows that he is the created. He knows that he is not wise enough to come and literally perform God's way or to perform the plan of God that should be unfolded. What is required is to step into the power of the Almighty. And Abraham clearly understands that he is a recipient or he is one who is receiving the reward and the goodness of God and not the producer of God's goodness. I hope that you hear that. He is not one who is a recipient who can just perform this on his own. No, he is a recipient of the goodness of God and not the producer of his goodness. We must come to this place whereby we as a people understand the humility and the humbleness to come before our God and to know that our hearts must walk in obedience. There is a rightful act that we must recognize that we are the weaker. We are the created. We are not the one whom has created, nor are we the ones who can perform by the wisdom of God without the power of God. Thus we need the power that has been endowed upon us, even as it was unto the apostles in Acts chapter 2. We are merely a channel or a conduit that God works through. That we must always realize they are neither the power nor the source that is produced in man. It is only accomplished through the reward of his son Jesus Christ. It is the authority of Jesus Christ that now ignites our altar even as Abraham ignited altars that we would come into a true worship unto the King of Kings, unto the Father. So let me say this about Abram. Abraham goes throughout the land, and he is one who is raising up altars in several different places. But what exactly is happening when he worships the living God? What exactly is going on on the land as well as in the heavenlies? Remember, I said that this is a new warfare. This is a way by which we can fight for a region, 
for our families and for a people or a territory, however you want to look at this. I don't know what is going on in your territory that is not godly. I don't know what has affected your family that is not godly. But I know that God has given us a strategy. He has given us a way that we may be able to fight not only in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm. That we can see the power of God reveal and change can come. Remember what was in the land of Canaan. And remember what God did. God called a man that he may worship him with whole heart, that he may be obedient unto him. The time of Abraham was a time of obedience. Abraham, be obedient and I will give you this. Whenever God speaks with covenantal words, there is always a requirement by your standard. And then there is the work of the Lord and the power of God to move within the altar. And that altar is the altar that is within your heart. We are not talking about the sacrificial system here. We are talking about an altar where God dwells in your heart, where God hears you and you can hear the still voice of God, rewarding those who will walk in obedience to be in the word and to fight with the battle of the tongue, that we would fight with the words of the authority of Jesus Christ and reclaim our land, reclaim our families. The altar is a powerful thing. So what is this altar? I said this in the first lesson of the prayer altar, in that the attributes of the altar are still prevalent today. Those, those prevalent pieces are that God would desire a stone that had not been hooned or had not been carved upon. That was because as soon as that would be carved upon, it would literally become an idol. That's not what he desires. He does not desire idols. He also desired that there should be a sacrifice. And in that sacrifice, uh, you know, blood was shed. And we have been brought into that sacrifice. And that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. He shed his blood for us, causing you and I to come into a place where we are literally called the living sacrifice. So though we are dead in Christ, we live. We live in Christ now, and so now we are a living sacrifice that is to be pleasing unto God. Uh, on, the, on the altar of all, there was the fire, which now is represented by the consuming fire, the Holy Spirit that burns within us. And hopefully it is guiding our altar. It is guiding those things which we desire to see changed by the presence of God and by the power of God. So Abraham was not simply raising altars to raise altars, but he was moving through the land and he was literally causing the presence of God to be greater established within the land. He was pushing the darkness of the land, the mindsets of the ites out of the land. And so he was fighting that battle not only on the land by raising up the altar in the physical sense, but he was fighting it in the spiritual realm as well by honoring God. He was literally opening portholes from heaven onto the land. And so God was literally resting in these places. And as God rests in these places and as Abram raised an altar, he would pierce that canopy of darkness. The scripture says that darkness prevails over the nations. But we as the people of God, as we pray and we break through that, we can bring forth the light of God upon the earth. So let me say this, my friends. Beloved, God desires that you would have an altar in your home, that you would draw the presence of God into your house, that you would draw the presence of God not only uh, to establish him there, but to see him do what he did even in this day, that he would then become provoked and that his, his, his fear and his presence will begin to change the atmosphere. And as that atmosphere changes, God will place his name upon your home, upon your family. And you, as you steward the altar of your heart by reading the word of God, by being a people of prayer, you will begin to fight the battle even as Abram fought it. If Abram, by one man, could make a way that would see a seed that would bless through generations, how great is the power of the altar, that we would be a people who would be in his word, 
establishing his presence within our home to see the power of God battle for us. Don't forget, my friends, it was a progressive covenant. The Lamb of God has come unto the earth, and we are in covenant with the living God. We can declare those same promises that Abram had by his altar into our altar. God is the defender of his people. God said, I will give you this. He wants us to take dominion. He wants us to come in agreement with him. He wants us to be obedient. May the altar of our hearts ignite. And may we be a people like Abram, warring, warring for the things of God. We desire that you would know the truth of the living God, that his word is like a double-edged sword, that he has equipped you by the word of your mouth, that you would be able to war in the heavenlies, that you would be able to call upon the living God, the almighty God, and he will answer. My friends, set your life as a living sacrifice by the altar of your heart to engage the almighty God. Set it in place. Read the word in your family and in the midst of your family. Don't be someone who gathers the word and prays after you have set your children to sleep. Let them witness the goodness of God. How great would it be that if you were praying about a particular situation, that your children would hear that, they would see that, and when God answered that prayer, it would settle within their hearts. It would, it would come as a seed within their hearts that they would know my parents serve the living God, and I have seen the faithfulness of my God because I see the result of their prayer. Oh, that we may sow into our children the altar of the heart, the binding of truth, the binding of the power of God within this realm. My friends, this ancient way, this ancient way of winning battles within our homes, within our regions, has not died away, but is being rekindled through the altar of your heart, through the word of God, through the worship of our King, and through the obedience of our walk, that God may come down and reveal himself yet again. Pray for your land. Pray for your family. Pray for your nation. Pray for those who despitefully and wickedly come against you. Pray for your government. Pray that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will come down and battle as he did in the days of Abram. That we may see the goodness of God again in our homes and our families and the power of God to arrest darkness, to push darkness out. Be a people of light. Be a people of the salt of the earth. And be a people who are willing to come into covenant with God. It is his battle. It is his fight. And it is his recompense that will strengthen you to come into the battle and see the victory. Yours, my friend, is the position of righteousness that God has given you. Yours is the position of honoring God, being in his word, praying, seeking the face of God. Your position is a position of worship. Let him battle for you. Don't take the battle up by the strength of your arm, for in the strength of your arm, you will have to rely upon it to go through the whole battle. But when it is the strength of the Lord, my friends, the knees that are weak are girded, and those who are weak are made strong. For he takes the foolish things of this world to despise those who think they are wise. Oh, listen to the thunder that rumbles in the background. That's not a, that's not a made up sound. That is the voice of our God that is literally outside my house right now. I believe the heavenlies are being shaken right now because the truth of God is going forth in Liberia. Liberia, rise up. Rise up and raise your altars. Honor the Almighty God. Go to the Word. Let the word become a feasting part of your life and feed on the bread of life and honor the God who made you and worship him. Let the kingdom of God come into your home. Let the presence of God increase in your house that you may see the goodness of the kingdom of God being prevailing over your family. Mighty God, I thank you for your goodness. 
I thank you for your thunderous voice that you cause the earth to shake and you cause men to tremble. May you be honored with the altars that will be raised up this week. Altars not of the sacrificial system, but altars of the heart that desire to know you, that will go into your word, that will pray, that will know that you are defending us, that you are the God of covenant. You are the God who will battle for your people. You are the God who will come and put your name upon their residence. You are the God who will bring your peace into the house and into the family. You are our great defender. You are the strong tower that we run into. And we are the righteous whose prayers shall avail much in the land, O oh God. May you prepare us to fight in this ancient way, God, that we may honor you, that we may prevail, that we may know the victory of the living God. Now, God, you who is able to do exceedingly far more than we ever ask or imagine, come and infuse your people with the truth of the altar. Bring them to the word of life. Bring them to the place where they may see the river increase not only from their ankles but into the past the loins up to the neck and overwhelming them with the goodness of you father i bless the people of liberia i bless their tongues to be a blessing and not a curse i bless them by the presence of you and i say let the favor of god be upon you let the favor of God be with you. Not that you may get what you want, but that God may be with you in every circumstance. Almighty King, make your name known in the land. Make your name known in the living, O God, in the name of Jesus. And may dominion again come to the land of Liberia, that the King of kings and the Lord of lords will be exalted. That the Almighty God may again come with power and strength. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Liberia, rise in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for your goodness and your time. Amen.